back for the word on Wednesday. Uh, before we get to our prayer list, let's uh, ask the Lord to bless our time together, our study afterwards as well. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you're here with us tonight. Lord, we pray, Lord, that the thoughts that we would have tonight, the words that would be spoken tonight, when we open the word, it looks in us, and Lord, we would look back into it, Lord, that everything would be pleasing to you, Lord, and that which is not, Lord, that we would just repent and give it right back and say, forgive us, Lord. Lord, we ask in advance, uh, as we will ask here shortly, uh, that you would bless those that are in dire straits, Lord, that those who are experiencing health, mental, and emotional issues, Lord, Lord, that you would, uh, if uh, necessary, uh, just make our hearts passionate and compassionate toward these folks and allow us to be your hands and feet of mercy and grace uh, to these ones. Bless our time together tonight. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We have a couple of updates on our prayer list. Uh, Wanda had called in a little bit after the publishing of the uh, prayer list today with an update on, uh, as you see on other requests, Chrissy and Mike Haberstump Haber, Haber uh, there. Mike went ahead, passed away, uh, got promoted. And so we don't, you know, pray for him any longer, but it's family. So that was some of uh, Tim and Krista's friends, uh, Air Force buddies so to speak and so just pray for the family uh we they appreciate the prayers but now we need to pray for the uh, the survivors there his wife uh chrissy and his two sons so continue to pray uh for chrissy and the sons there at the passing of the father and the husband um Clegi, uh, as you see on your prayers list he's doing better but he is uh, not at home he's in a uh, health care facility cambridge village um, that's, uh, I can't, that's off of what I'm being told that it's part of, um, off of Eastwood Road, uh, part of that complex over there. What's it called? Carolina Bay. That's what I'm being told. Uh, I've never been there myself. Uh, you can't go and visit anybody there right now anyway. Uh, if you wanted to go visit him, his case worker is not there until tomorrow. And she's the one that has to admit or deny uh, visitors. So uh, only Joanne's been in so far with him during the admission process. But uh, you can call him. He called me tonight uh, before uh, we came. And so he is uh, he's there. He's comfortable. It says it's nice and it's clean and the staff is nice. So that's good. So uh, that's where he's at. I don't know how long he'll be there. It says for one to two weeks of rehab. So, um, you know, I know that he did very little rehab work while he was in the hospital because of several different circumstances that were ongoing. So if he's there for at least a week, you know, you'll have an opportunity to call him a few times or maybe perhaps go see him. All right. Um, let's see. Other updates. Uh, I mentioned last week that Melva was uh, going back to Duke for surgery, so continue to pray for her. I spoke with her on the phone. Um, just a couple of days ago, uh, I think it was Monday, and so she's rather she's still upbeat and positive. So uh, encourage her with a a call. Uh, she doesn't really do texts, so if you text her, she you know might not get it. So you'll have to call, and and she doesn't really do voicemail either because every time you call, you'll say voicemail box is full. <laughs> so you know if you don't get her on the phone, try 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 again. Um, all right, uh, others, uh, I talked with, um, I, I didn't talk with, I text back and forth with uh, Barbara Stewart at home, still not feeling well, so can, to continue to keep her in prayer uh, as well. Um, who else? Let's see. I can't think of anybody else as far as updates. How about you? Updates, additions, removals. Take you off. <laughs> so Leanne says that everything's great. So did he say anything whatsoever is coming down the road?
Yeah. So that's like a huge improvement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we made sure a couple things in this thing is on on the menu there. So so everything's good. As long as the oil is doing good, everything good. is where it needs to be, and the pressures are right. Great. You know, so it's good as hell. It drops just as good. Great. Great. So good report for Leanne and both her eyes, and so that's good. Your eyesight is actually better than mine. So I'm like one and one point two five or something like that. So that's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So uh Anything else? Updates? I've not heard anything from the manager today in the next few days or 30 days. I will talk to Mary and Matt Jones. And I do think she's fine. She's always this morning. She's like seven and two, seven injections in the morning. She's like, 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 she's
purposefully to look after the welfare of others, Lord, both spiritually and physically. Lord, we pray first for all of these that are on our prayer list. Number one, that they would know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And after that, that he would be their comfort through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that we, uh, that are also his, that we would be his hands and feet and ministers on his part, Lord, to these people. Lord, whatever it might mean, whether it's a phone call or a visit or maybe even a, something as simple as we think about, you know, a card or a phone call. Uh, sometimes it goes a, a little bit further and even a lot further than that, Lord, that we would show the love of Christ to people. So, Lord, help us to remember these folks throughout the week. Lord, that we would pray for them. Lord, that we would reach out to them. And, Lord, that you would be glorified in the things uh, that would be done on their behalf for you. Lord, I remember reading even this week that you were well pleased with the servant that had given you clothing, that had given you food, that had given you water to drink, that took you in from outside when it was cold. And you called them well done, good and faithful servant. May we be found to be equally deserving of that statement, a faithful servant. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, as I said this past Sunday, for those of you who weren't here, um, that the content for tonight would be the same scripture from this past Sunday. And so I want to just open the floor before we get there. I want to read the text first, and then I want to open the floor for questions. Um, I actually heard from somebody this week. Um, that said, hey, I've got questions. And there's nothing that thrills me more than people f feeling comfortable enough to ask the question, whatever that question might be. Even if it's a question that might seemingly, in some way you might think that it might sound like you have little faith. Ask the question. Ask the question. Sometimes we're embarrassed to ask the questions, right, that are in our minds. Don't be embarrassed to ask the question. And so that's what I want to do to begin with before we talk about the verses again, is just to read those verses, open the floor, and see if you've got questions about these verses, anything specifically about the verses, or what might have been said Sunday. Uh, whether you read the message notes um, that had been sent out, or you've watched the video, or you were here. If you've got questions, just the time to ask questions. So, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25, we read verse 25, and it says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of the created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. So, questions? I hear the crickets. So, Leanne says, those are tough verses. What do you mean? Just tough verses to ask a question about? Yeah, because I can't, can't form a question out really because I don't know that I really truly understand what they say. It's a, it's a, okay. I can't, I can't, I'm probably kind of picking out bits and pieces of things to even try to put something together. 
All right, so like I said in the message um, Sunday, it's important for us not to take this out of the context of the letter to Hebrews. So the letter to the Hebrews was written to a distinct group of Jews living in a, a particular place, likely not Jerusalem, likely out of what would be called commonplace Israel. They were likely living in a place that might be something like Ephesus or Colossae or some place like that that would have been more Greek than it would have been Hebrew. So these would have been people who were living in a minority as far as their ethnic you know, a band, a stripe of that community. Uh, they were living in a time when Roman occupied, Roman rule was pretty much most of the Middle East as far as we know, and Southern Europe. And so they were living in something that was even more entrenched into Roman and Greek gods and worship of gods and things of that nature, the worship of Caesar. They were living as a minority in that in that world and they were looked down upon because of who they were just in general and then when you leave your little subsect of judaism you're leaving a minority group ethnically speaking and you're going to a religiously you know oriented group that is super minority and so now these groups right here called christians and all those that all that that comes with that, because there's some that are in the camp, so to speak, that are, aren't really Christians. These are really taking it from both sides, so from the Greek and Roman side, and also from the home folks, the Jews, which they're kinfolk and relatives, and so they're caught like, and I use that phrase between a rock and a hard place or hard hard spot, and so they're they're being persecuted in there. And so the purpose of the entire letter, not just this portion of this letter, is to do a comparison and contrast between the old and the new and show the superiority over, of the new over the old. That still goes right here. But with the superiority of the benefit, the peril increases as well. The, the rhetoric of the peril increases and it does here in this particular passage this is one of the three passages in in hebrews in which the warning gets really strong really really strong and it begins with the comparison of in the days of moses versus the day of the lord jesus christ so how many of you are familiar with the phrase the day of the lord the day of the lord and so when you hear the phrase, the day of the Lord, it, this is what it should bring up into your mind. Judgment. And it's not judgment for everyone. It's judgment for the non-believer. The day of the Lord is what is being referred to here in some part. And he's saying, look at what it says here. See to it that you do not refuse him, capital H. Okay, I, I think that's really talking about the Holy Spirit. It could be Jesus, but I think it's talking about the Holy Spirit there. Him who is speaking. And I made the reference Sunday that who is it that speaks to us? When the data of the gospel, when the fact of the gospel reaches our ears. Scott comes and testifies to a neighbor, for example. That's transference of information, transference of data in the technology world today. That's just transmission of data. What is it that makes that data in the receiver ring true? Or for that receiver to say that is true. That is him, capital H, who is speaking to the within person, to the inside. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those, okay, those, this is referring back to the Old Testament, for those who did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, who was it that warned them on earth? Moses. And then after Moses, who was it? All the prophets. And so it could be plural, it could be singular, 
But they're all performing the same task of warning. That's what the prophet does. Thus saith the Lord, you know, straighten up and fly right. Straighten up and fly right. And so we have this comparison here of the old Moses who refused. We could take that quite literally. Much less will we escape who turn away from him, capital H again, who warns from heaven. You see, the gospel is not good news unless there's bad news. You have to have something to compare. You can't have light without dark. What is, what is light and what is darkness? Darkness is the absence of light. And so you can't have the good news of the gospel except there be something on the other side of the scale, so to speak. And here's the thing. If they didn't listen to Moses and the law and they received their just condemnation, which included death in some cases, people fell dead. People were bitten by serpents, right? People, you know, some people were, the earth opened up and they fell in the earth. Go back to Joshua's day. Remember when they went to Ai and they took some of the goods and boom, gone right to the earth. Swallowed them up. Boom, gone. You know, King Saul died because of his wickedness. He was taken off the throne. Samson, he died because of his, you know, his disloyalty to the Lord. And so if they didn't escape that type of punishment, the author is saying, do you really think that you're going to escape judgment from him above? And then that comparison sits there for a minute. Let, let, let that sit there a minute. And now let's think about the severity of the earthly consequences and compare those to the eternal consequences. There's a great movement to think of God's punishment, if there be such a thing, as being short-lived in American theology. It's popular to think that God is a loving God, and therefore, He might discipline you, but surely, surely, You'll, you'll not be sent to hell. That's one extreme. Another uh, version of that is, surely, if there is a hell, and you are sent there, it won't be eternal. It will be of a definite duration. Or there's another version of that, that if there is a hell, that it's almost like an immediate annihilation. So for a second, it might hurt, and then it's over, and you receive your punishment, and your soul will perish, and nothing left. Burned up like in a furnace, so to speak. All of those don't match the Bible at all. Don't come close. And that's the next comparison. But before I get there, any thoughts or any questions, anything to clear up about verse 25 in that verse? So who do you think would need to hear a warning like that? Right. Precisely. But notice the word see to it that. See to it that. I think that's an appeal to the Christian to look out all around themselves and remember the title of the message this past Sunday? The Peril of Presumption. How many people do you think that have entered through these doors and left just as lost as they were when they came in? How many people do you think have entered in through these doors, not just on one occasion that way, but for day after week after month after year and year and year and year and year. Think carefully. Is it possible for a person to go to church 20 years and not be saved? 
Dr. Bennett used to teach, and when he taught on eternal security, he would often tell the story of his personal secretary in Fort Smith, Arkansas, at First Baptist Fort Smith, Arkansas, who during a staff meeting, now I'm talking about boardroom type staff meeting. This was a church that Dr. Bennett taught a thousand person Sunday school class every Sunday morning. Listen to me. A thousand person Sunday school class every Sunday morning. That he led 5,000 people through the evangelism explosion training. This was a huge church. The largest church in Fort Smith at that time. And his secretary, who had been with him for more than 10 years, cried out in the middle of the staff meeting with all these pastors. You got the youth pastor, you got the senior pastor, you got the care pastor, you got this pastor, you got that pastor. All of them in there. Music minister, all those things. I'm lost! And Dr. Bennett looked at her and said, what are you talking about? She looked like, she talked like, she dressed like, she attended like, she looked just like she was born again. Did all the things that would make one think that she had been born again. But in the middle of that staff meeting, she recognized through whatever was said or what the Holy Spirit did, and she cried out and she received Jesus in that staff meeting. Been with Dr. Bennett 10 or more years as his secretary. And as his secretary, you know what she did? Dr. Bennett would handwrite his messages. And I have, I, have, uh, I have electronic PDF or JPEG pictures of some of Dr. Bennett's messages. Handwritten. And I also have the electronic copies where she would type his messages. And she did that for more than 10 years. And she was lost, lost, lost. Friend, I'm telling you, there's probably Franklin Graham, I heard him say that on the radio just this week, yesterday, that there's probably more people in church lost than there is saved. His dad said there's 85% of attendees, he said this in the 90s, 85% of the church attendees are lost. And that's why I say that the see to it that is addressing Christians to look out and to be on guard for those who are presuming something to be not a fact. I said that this Sunday too. That presumption in this regard has eternal consequences. Not just earthly, but eternal consequences. Remember Jesus said my favorite go-to verse when we talk about in eternal security is to show that it's not as secure for some as they think. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, speaking there in the parable uh, of the Sermon on the Mount, said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And it said, they will come to, him, they will come to me and say, did we not do X, Y, and Z? And his response in verse 23 is, depart from me, I never knew you. And that knew there, ginosko, is more of an understanding of an intimate knowledge and experience with a person. A relationship, in other words. So if they perished in the Old Testament era under Moses following the law, how much more severe will those who don't fall in line with what the requirements are? Basically denying Jesus not really accepting Jesus, how much more assured are we of an eternal punishment, a more severe punishment? That's essentially what I would say that verse 25 is communicating to us today. It's just like them. If, if we've truly been born again, we need to understand that there's more than just today hanging on you know, the line here. There's more on the line than just today. 
So any thoughts or questions about verse 25? When I, when I see things like that, I'm always reminded of the mistakes that I've made in the past. How prone I am and how prone everybody else is likewise. So even good, well-intentioned people uh, doing what they think is the right thing for the right reasons uh, can be wrong. And so uh, we're all prone to that. None of us are immune. There's no vaccination for that. Only death. So anyway. So any thoughts about verse 25? So what is the faith? What is the assured faith? It compares again the days when they stood at the mountain, the mountain of God in the Old Testament with Moses. It says, and his voice shook to earth then, back in that day. It says, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. And... Um, I mentioned, you know, Doug this past weekend as being our resident scientist and, you know, uh, uh, doctor in physics because that's what he specialized in was physics and mathematics. He's, a, he's actually a, a Ph.D. And so he is a degreed, earned degreed individual. And if you've ever talked to him, uh, you, you can discern that pretty quickly. He's very analytical, engineering-like, very precise. And he actually came to me after the message this past week and said, I really like the reference to physics. Of course, you know, that's in his wheelhouse. But if God has the power to just vibrate terra firma, the earth, he created this stuff, as I said Sunday. He has the power to do it precisely what it says right here, to shake also the heavens. He has the magnitude of power to shake not only this earth, but this solar system and the universe to which we belong. And if you go read after Revelation 9, I think it is, or 6, uh, onward, and you read Daniel, and you read Peter, Second Peter, I gave the reference to Second Peter, um, they talk about in Revelation the end of the what we know now during the tribulation and the after effects of the tribulation, that the earth will be basically 
incinerated or vaporized, so to speak, and into non-existence. And that's what we're talking about here. It says, quote in the Old Testament, because it's in capital letters, and he says, verse 27, this expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken. What can be shaken? The created things, it says, as of the created things. So that, purpose statement here, the, the creation is going to be removed so that only one thing remains. That's that thing which cannot be shaken. And what is that? That's God and God's kingdom. That's God and God's kingdom. So the, the awesome nature of the power there is just mind-boggling. I mean, if, if, if we had any idea of the size and scope of the universe or the complexity of even this solar system, for example, the power that it would take to just eliminate it, it's just mind-boggling. That's the type of power that will be unleashed and that's the type of power that people who do not know our Lord will in some sense experience. So, consequently, therefore, chapter 12, verse 28, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, who is that? That's believers. So we have believers and see to it that, and we have believers and therefore since we receive a kin kingdom that cannot be shaken. God cannot be shaken and His kingdom cannot be shaken. Since we receive a, a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us, let us live in a way that shows God gratitude. Might be a way that you might paraphrase that. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. And so this past weekend, we, we defined the term there, what is acceptable service? And we said that that phrase has the idea, the connotation of worship. Worship. That harkens us back to what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Anybody remember what that, those verses say? How about just turning there? Let's get a little bit more Bible calisthenics in tonight. Romans 12.1. Romans 12.1. Yep. So in the New American Standard, we read verse 1 reading, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. That ties directly into the idea that the author of Hebrews has right here. Is that our gratitude is expressed in worship. And we said, well, what is worship? Remember what we said about worship? Worship can be expressed in anything and everything that we say and we do. Including our work. Including our recreation. All of those things that we do in our life can be expressions of worship to Him. It's not just meeting here on Sunday and singing hymns or, you know, praise music. Everything that we say and do can be an expression of worship. So, any questions about that? Gratitude and acceptable service being worshipped. You know, something else that can be rendered acceptable service. Remember that two weeks ago, the text that we had was out of Matthew 21. Remember, it was the parable of two sons. They were asked to go into the vineyard and work. And so, those two sons were asked to go into the vineyard and work. One said uh, no, but then uh, later had remorse and changed his mind and went and worked. And one said yes, and didn't go into the vineyard and work our actually doing service, the work of the Lord, can be worship. 
So actually doing what he's left us here to do, it can be considered worship. And then I mentioned Dr. John Salehammer Sunday. Dr. Uh, John Salehammer has passed away, but he was at Southeastern while I was there and then went to uh, Master Seminary in, in California where he uh, passed away. Um, see, there is some health dangers on the left coast. So uh, that's California, by the way. Anyway, um, he's with the Lord. And uh, he, in his Old Testament research, particularly in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, specialized in the book of Genesis. And he's the one that coined the idea and the phrase, workship. That Adam and Eve were placed in the garden and everything that they did, including the idea of tending the garden. Like, do you think really the garden needed, like, weeding? No. Do you think that the bushes needed pruning? Probably not. But what were they doing? They were doing what God told them, tending. They were probably harvesting fruit, eating, just looking after things. But what they were doing, their act of doing it was called workship. And that's what he coined in a thesis. And, and I believe he's, he's probably right. Because Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3, verses 17 and 23, Something very similar to that. He said, whatever you do in word or deed, do it as unto the Lord. What do you do as unto the Lord? You primarily worship and focus worship toward the Lord. Adoration. Remember the little prayer acronym that we had that I taught some of you that were in my Sunday school class? The acts, adoration was the number one for A. Adoration, you, you adore God. Adoration. And so that's, that's worship. You're worshiping. Adoration is a, is, could be a synonym for worship. So everything that we do can be an act of worship. So what we have here in, in this particular section is that what we do uh, called an acceptable service could be worship, and that could be everything from the mundane, you know, things that some people think that, you know, housewives or homebodies or whatever, or it's just a mundane thing, but that's an act of worship. So think of it that way. I think, I think the workplace would be a whole lot better if every Christian would take seriously their Christianity and act as if their workplace was a place to worship God. Because I've seen a lot of just poor representatives of Jesus Christ in the workplace. And I mean just downright despicable. So, next time you have a co-worker said, hmm, you ever think about work as being worship? Just a thought. And with reverence and awe, with reverence and awe, reverence doesn't mean, you know, cower down fear, but it means a holy respect. And in light of what we talked about, the power to do what says is going to be done, the heavens are going to be shaken, that's something to be respected. You know, it's kind of like electricity. How many of you like to mess around with electricity? You respect it then, right? You show it reverence. You know, you, you like to use it, right? You like it to be available for you, right? You find it beneficial to you, right? That's respect. All right? And awe. Well... I can't imagine what would be more awesome to think about God's creative power that we've already discussed. And then finally, for verse 29, our, for our God is a consuming fire. So you could apply that to what has been said from verse 26 through 27 there about the earth being shaken and also the heavens. You could apply that as the whole act of that as being a refining process of all the creation to bring in the new heaven and new earth, which will come down from God. You can think about it as being a winnowing, a separation of the sheep and the goats. You can think about it as, you know, just the new creation, as through fire. So, the object here again is to compare the old to the new, and say, hey, look, this over here was a picture of what would be better 
that is this over here, the new. And be careful if you act like those back then did here and forego, delay, or refuse, know for certain that your judgment will come. And it will come in a magnitude much greater and more fearful than they hear. So that's just the gist of what's going on there in this passage. Jonathan Edwards uh, had a sermon that he preached and his circuit preached um, thousands and thousands and thousands of times called Sinners in the Hands of Angry God based out of a text in Deuteronomy 31. And when I read through this passage, that sermon came to my mind. And I went back and I pulled up just the, the introductory notes to it and began to read it and read the verses out of Deuteronomy 31 again about what he, he was thinking and trying to communicate to people that it's a, it's a perilous thing for a sinner to fall into the hands of an angry God. And one day, there will be an angry God that comes. And when Jesus comes again and stands for the second time on the Mount of Olives, you can literally say without any reservation that all hell will break loose. The lion and the lamb will come with one accord and speak destruction upon all those who don't know the Lord Jesus that day. Lord, we thank you that uh, even in the midst of things that are hard and difficult to understand, Lord, you give us little tidbits and little places to grab a hold of, uh, little pieces of truth, Lord, that we can sink our teeth into and, and hold on as you, you begin to uh, teach. I'm reminded so much of how Jesus spoke so many times, sometimes in parables and sometimes in straight language. And the disciples came back and said, Lord, what did you mean? And so, Lord, if there are any of us that are here, and myself included, happened so many times, Lord, let us not be embarrassed by that. For if our little infinite or our little finite minds could grasp the infinite, Lord, we, we wouldn't need you. you. You would not be but one of many gods. And so you are the only true God, infinite in knowledge and understanding. And Lord, we struggle. That's why we need you and the person of the Holy Spirit to take these words, to sink them deep in our heart, and, and to bring out and to draw out the color and meaning, the breadth and the depth, as Lord, we meditate and as we live each and every day, I'm more like Jesus than we were the day before. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.